by running back through the wire and blind. So do I, yeah. How many, how many tonight on a, just on a quick topical survey, how many in this room feel that if the world was Christian, the whole world, how many feel that it would be a better off world? Amen. Paul had to write to the Galatians, uh, the Christians in Galatia, and say, you started off well. Who has bewitched you? Chapter 3. Who has bewitched you? Who has used sorcery to deceive you? They used to start out in the grace of Christ and in the knowledge of his saving power and grace and turn back to the law and defect from the faith. Who bewitched you? I say to America tonight, you started off well. Who's bewitched you? You started off well in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. I think there were 13 or 15 of the signers that were reverends. They were graduates of seminaries of the founding fathers. America has started off well. I say yes tonight. This world would be better off if it was a Christian world. Amen. Amen. Yes. America would be a better nation if it was dedicated to the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ Amen. and be reconciled to God. God has not failed. The Word has not failed. Everything was fine in the Garden of Eden until somebody, one of the two, thought they had a better idea than God. Because they wanted to be equal with God. The same sin that brought Lucifer down out of heaven called pride and arrogance is the same that took her out, eventually took him with her. I want to be like God. I want to know everything that he knows. I want to be equal. In other words, I want to be equal with God. And if that won't do, I'll get rid of him and I'll be my own God. And that's where we are tonight. We're parked right there. I want to be my own God. Don't tell me. Don't judge me. <laughs> don't hold me accountable. What do you think you are telling me? Don't preach to me. Don't tell me. We hear this constantly. This was the problem with the children of Israel. Look it up in the scriptures. The big problem is that there was no spiritual leader in the nation and everybody did what they thought was right in their own eyes and consequently you have mayhem. You can't help but have mayhem. Amen. We've been working out of Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6 and 7. Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds through the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. We talked about the soundness of mind. Right? Remember that? Mm -hmm. Then we went over to the conscience. We've been talking about the conscience here like the other way. How that man was given a conscience after he was expelled from the Garden of Eden. He was given a piece of God, a chunk of God in his own heart and life, in his own innate being. And that to me I see as God writing his law in the hearts of men. Amen. And it's called a conscience. That conscience had two-fold 
job, twofold function. One was to have the con listen, I'm accept the conscience had twofold function. One was to house the law of God. Secondly, to serve as a GPS home device to bring people back to God. To find their way home to God. Tonight I want to talk to you some more about the conscience. The conscience also is a piece of God in us that gives us discernment. Isn't that right? Right. right. If you look in Merriam-Webster's dictionary, you, they define it as a voice, a small voice inside. Merriam-Webster. Webster Dictionary. That's not even no Webster 1820. This is Marion Webster Dictionary. A voice inside. Oh, Webster Dictionary now, you know, enforces enforces the idea that voices, you can hear voices. <coughs> so Webster's Dictionary said there's a voice, a feeling, a voice that speaks inside of you to guide you. So Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. voice. And that voice comes with every boy and girl that's born of a woman in this world. Every boy and girl, glory, that's born in this world. God gives them an ear to hear his voice. In the form of their conscience to house the law of God and to give them a GPS direction home. We talked last week about the conscience being sprinkled with the blood of Jesus Christ in order to cleanse that conscience. Tonight I, I want to address, I, I, did, I thought I was so proud of myself. Normally, these are my notes. All that you see here. That'll be about an hour and a half teaching and preaching right there. I did really good. I typed it out. <laughs> Man, I'm Diana be proud of me. She didn't know I did this, but I'm I'm really making headway here. I'm super proud. And the way I have it up here is that where our conscience comes from, how it is formed, altered, transformed, and why, this is all important. So where does the conscience come from? Yes, and I want to give you the scriptures tonight. I want you to turn with me to Romans chapter 1. <coughs> Romans chapter 1, verse 18 to verse 25. Romans chapter 1, verse 18 to verse 25. Then we'll go to chapter 2, verse 12 to 16, with an emphasis on verse 50. For the wrath of God... Is that correct? Yeah. Verse 18? Yeah. Is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness. Did you get that? The wrath of God. Right now, as we speak, if there is pain in the world, the wrath of God is revealed. This is what it says. From heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. They hold the truth down. Under the suppression and oppression of unrighteousness. They suppress the truth. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, that means it's evident among them. For God has shown it to them. Have you ever had one of your children mess things up that you gave them explicit orders and explicit directions, explicit description of what needs to be done? And they have the mental capacity to understand what you're saying, but attack the situation and the task at hand 
with total disregard and just did it. I did it my way. <laughs> I almost killed one of my boys one time. <laughs> Tore up my whole friend in the car. Mm. Whole front end. <laughs> Tore it up. I didn't I told him get out of my sight and I don't know what I'm gonna do with you. Just leave leave the premises before I do something I may regret. This whole world right now suppressing, pressing down, holding down the truth. <coughs> when it's staring them in the face, they're denying it. Yes. Since the creation, watch now, God showed it to him in verse 19. Verse 20, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen. Now watch now. Paul is saying that the invisible is clearly seen. So that whether you're a saved or unsaved person, whether you're righteous or unrighteous, whether you're sanctified or not, it is seen both of the sinner and the saint. Amen. Amen. The saint and the sinner both can see the same thing. Invisible attributes of God are clearly visible. Amen. Thou art inexcusable, Paul says to them. Clearly seen, being understood by the things that were made. Even his eternal power and Godhead, are you getting this Godhead thing, the divine nature of God, so that they're without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God. Watch now. Now he's saying that both the righteous and the unrighteous knew God. Get that? Oh, how can that be? Because of the law that's written in their hearts. They knew God. And then they knew God by his, by the visible creation which demonstrate and evidence the invisible attributes of God. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts. I want to say futile. He means empty, vain, foolish, useless, and confused, and became foolish in their hearts because of darkness. Did you see here in the last day or two that there are a number of elite upper echelon of Hollywood, of the millionaires? that have been paying upwards of a half million dollars to pay off the universities to get their kids in there and falsify their grades and diplomas so that they can have a better paying job when they come out not knowing hardly, hardly how to put a paragraph together. It's coming out. There's going to be about 50 people. They go to jail too. That's just the tip of the iceberg. And the FBI agent that's investigating said that money will not buy them their freedom here. They're going to jail too. Do not pass go, do not collect $200, go directly. In other words, they're going to be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. They won't be able to buy their way out of this one. That's state and federal, that's state and federal government. Think about it. Now, listen to what it says in verse 22. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like the corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals creeping things. Watch now, let's look up here for a moment. If there's anything that can insult God, <coughs> if you really want to insult God, reduce him to an animal. And even the secular society in terms of the public school education, they have bought into this thing, Christian or non-Christian, that we human beings are of the animal kingdom. That we are an animal. Now if you want to insult God, you might want to try that one on him. If you want to get a good slap upside the head with him, go ahead and tell him 
We're created in your image, but we're animals. That makes you what? An animal. I would say that we're animal in behavior. Same thing. Amen. We're animal in behavior, but we're not animal by creation. We've been given authority over all animals. Amen. Is that correct? Amen. When he created all the animals, the fowl of the earth, the fish of the sea, then he created man his own image and gave him power and dominion over all creation. See? No, we're not part of the animal. We're not part of a, a species of animals. Today, animals are up to the level of humans, and humans have been reduced to the level of animals. So what's the difference if you kill them and abort them? They're animals. In fact, there is more passion and compassion for little puppies and cats and kittens and little wild animals, little critters out there, is more compassionate for them than there is to our, hell, our fellow human being. Amen. Professing to be wise, they became fools. Now, fools are defined as fools by who? In other words, a fool cannot call another fool a fool. Amen. Is that correct? A fool cannot call and should not call another fool a fool. Take one and no one. That just double indemnity. That just that. Here, give me, give me the other microphone. Yeah, okay, good. This, this, this is that thing, It's coming and going there for a minute while ago. Got something to do with that wire. Thunderstorm. Turn it on. Uh, uh, I got you. Okay. Okay. Well, we're going to need some new equipment here. Praise mm -hmm. the Lord. We will. Yeah. A fool that calls a fool. A fool. The fool. The fool who's been called a fool doesn't feel bad at all. Because a fool called him a fool. <laughs> All right, now. <laughs> <clears throat> so, a fool being called a fool by a fool does not disturb his foolishness. Amen. 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 Yeah. Does not change his foolish demeanor. Amen. Because <clears throat> fools calling fools fools is almost complimentary. <laughs> It's almost a pat on the back. I'm as bad as you are, you're as bad as I am. Well, I feel better about that. I feel a whole lot better about myself now. Yeah. So who calls a fool a fool? a fool? With justification. God. Because he has set the standard. He has set the standard. When somebody defects or deviates from the standard, that God can call him a fool. As a matter of fact, in, in, in David's Psalms, he said, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. Amen. So the God calls atheists fools. Amen. Now, I might end up in jail for hate speech to God. Well, you better see if you can't huff, handcuff God because he's the one that said it, and I'm Simply quoting God. <laughs> now, and you know and detect and you're able to assess foolishness by the futility of their lives. If you look at all these that are going to be arrested with this fraud for university admissions and diplomas on the surface for all these years, Boy, didn't it look glamorous, didn't it look? That's why they call Los Angeles and Hollywood Tinsel Town. Because of nothing but glitter. But underneath that, it's rotten to the core. Amen. Amen. California, too. So, what, what's a fool defined? 
by the futility of their mind. They're empty. There's nothing there. Everything that they propose will come to an end. This world will pass away. And so will him, but not his word. So, in verse 24, you went verse 24? Where am I at up there? Huh? 23? 24. Let's do 24. Therefore, <laughs> sorry, Jesus. 24. Therefore, God gave them up to uncleanness. And now listen. When God gives you up, God hasn't given up on you, but he gave you over to your insanity. Remember we talked about this last week? What is a conscience that's been seared with a hot iron? We dealt with that last, last Wednesday. Once a conscience has been seared with a hot iron, I don't think there's a comeback. I've never seen anybody come back from a seared conscience. Because the searing there is equivalent to a branding of a cattle or a horse. Mm -hmm. And a slave. With a hot iron. Because whatever has been branded on you is a declaration of his ownership of you. Is that correct? Yeah. Whatever has been branded on you is the declaration of his ownership of you. Whatever that brand represents owns you. It's been branded. So if your conscience is branded by this foolishness, worshiping creation more than a creator, loving self more than God, Paul describes it to Timothy in the last days. Men shall be lovers of themselves more than lovers of God. And the list goes on describing the disposition of society in the last days and the demeanor of social behavior and cultural activities. So God does what? Gives them up to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. Watch. Who exchange the truth of God for a lie. I'll tell you what. Once a human being has changed the truth of God to a lie, if that's not close to branding your mind and your soul and your conscience with a hot iron, I don't know what is. Amen. When you change the truth of God, as a matter of fact, we have Christians across the country who brought it, who bought into the lie. You see here, what did we say a minute ago? Who bought into the lie, they believe the lie. In verse 25, who exchanged the truth of God for a lie. More and more that Christians have bought into the normalizing of homosexual behavior. I had a pastor friend that came to see me yesterday. And you remember a couple of weeks ago over in Greenville? How that at the public library they had these Drag queens, 25, 30 of them. He was in the second row, this preacher, filming with his phone all of this nonsense. And he came to see me yesterday. He was in tears. I said, how many kids were there? He said, between, conservatively, between three and four hundred children. Oh, my God. Between three and four hundred children and many of them professing Christians. He knew, he knew many of them. They believe lie. They believe lie. At what point does the branding start? We need to be acutely aware of what's going on in our society. Because I'll, I'll do my best to get to my lesson here in a minute. But because in here, I ask the question, where does the conscience come from? And how the conscience is altered, transformed, and how it is formed. And so, for this reason, verse 26, for this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. Let's just stop there for a moment. 
God gave them up to vile passions. Turn to chapter 2, verse 12 to 16. Watch this now. Chapter 2, verse 12 to 16. Now, if you've never robbed, have you ever robbed a bank, Brother Charlie? No, I put in people in jail. You haven't robbed a bank no. at gunpoint or anything like that. No. As a police officer, you've arrested a number of them, put them in jail, who did attempt to rob a bank, right? Oh, yeah, yeah right, too. So, robbing a bank doesn't even rise to your thought pattern to consider. There's no, there's no consideration for that. No, no, sir. Has anybody here been convicted of being an armed bank robber? Oh. Nobody. <laughs> So, guess what Satan's not going to try to tempt me with? Bank robbery. You, you've been a victim of So, it's, it's not going to rise to your conscience. It's not going to tempt you. It's not going to even come across. It's not going to be on the radar of your brain. Your conscience not there. But I'll tell you how it happens. We have permitted things in our lives that years ago we would say no to. And the transformation of the conscience or the molding of the conscience, conscience, conscience did not come to go from zero to robbing a bank with a gun. It doesn't go from zero to that in one shot. It goes in increments. It comes in increments. We're going to be talking about desensitization and the plan of the devil to destroy Christian's life. Now, chapter 2, verse 12 to 16, with an emphasis on verse 15. Verse 12, and chapter 2. For as many have sinned without the law, will also perish without the law. And as many as have sinned in the law, will be judged by the law. Let me, let me explain that to you briefly, okay? For as many as have sinned without the law, means... That's the Gentile community who never saw the Ten Commandments. So if they live their life outside the law of the Ten Commandments, the law of God given to Moses, when they die, they'll die outside the law. Does that make sense? Yes. As many as have sinned in the law will be judged by the law. So for the Jews who've had the law, and live by the law will be judged by the law. Verse 13. For not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law are justified. And so the Gentiles, they may have had little tidbits from the Jews, what the law may have been, but they had no reference point. So the hearing of it didn't justify that. So you have to be inculcated into the law before you can be judged by the law. So if you've ever wondered what happens to people who've never been saved, people who've never known the Ten Commandments, people who've never heard of Jesus Christ, what's going to happen to them? Don't worry about it. God has an eternal plan because they're going to be judged outside the law. It's not the law of the Ten Commandments or the law of God given on Mount Sinai that's going to judge them. There's another law. The law that God had written in their hearts. Conscience. The conscience. That God's going to judge them with. This is what the Apostle Paul is saying here now. Verse 14. For when Gentiles, who do not have the law, watch now, by nature do the things in the law. How about that? How many times have I been telling you folks? That God has placed all the Ten Commandments in the heart of man without even reading the Ten Commandments. Amen. Never being exposed to the Ten How many times you've heard me say this? The tribes around the world who have never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, who told them to get married? Who told them that stealing was wrong? Who told them that murder was wrong? Who told them that lying was wrong. The law of God 
was placed in them by nature to do the things of the law. See, this is the conscience that I've been talking to you about. The first question that I have here, where does this conscience come from? God, he has given his law to humanity. Yeah. This is why God gets angry. Because although you haven't heard Moses, although you haven't heard the gospel of Jesus Christ and the cross and Calvary and born again and all that good stuff, you still have had the law by nature given to you by God. You become inexcusable to God. To violate your conscience is to violate God whether you know him or not. Amen. 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 It's very important for us to see that. When Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things of the law. These, although not having the law, are a law to themselves. Are you getting this? That is their law. That's why these tribal people have a society. A civil society. Because they're following the law. That God gave them by nature. In fact, they even have little chapels of their own. Shrines. They worship God. They make a totem pole. They may worship a tree. They may worship a monkey. They may worship a bird, the sun, the moon. I don't care what they worship, even the Native Indians of America. The big Manitou up here, the big spirit. I mean, they, they worship the, the eagles. They worship the sky, the wind, the, the, the rivers. They didn't know how to describe God. But it was innately within them to worship. That's the first commandment. Know that God, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God. And they were worshiping God. Without knowing him. Cornelius was worshiping God without knowing it. Mm -hmm. He was praying to God, not knowing who he was talking to. Mm -hmm. Nature, God placed it there. So the whole Ten Commandments is already put into their hearts. Watch now. For when Gentiles, who do not have the law by nature, do the things of the law, these, although not having the law, are a law to themselves. Watch now, verse 15. Who show the work of the law written in their all hat. Somebody shout praise the Lord. Amen. Who show the work of the law written in their hearts. Amen. Brother, Brother they, they, Leo, are you getting this? Oh, yes, sir. All right. I can see you jumping inside. You're all excited. <laughs> see that? Show the work of the law written in their hearts. And guess what the next sentence says? Their conscience! Yeah. See that? What have I been talking about? Conscience. The conscience has a twofold function. is to house the law of God and to give you and I a GPS back toward God home. Thank you, Jesus. Gentiles who don't know the law, they don't know God, who by the work of the law written in their hearts. The work of the law. You see that? The work of the law is written in their hearts. That's why they get married. That's why they have laws keeping civility within their societies and their tribes. They're not allowed to kill. They're not allowed to 